Okay, everybody, let's, uh, let me start. Uh, welcome to the last uh, panel of uh, our today's conference called the Major Economic Reconfiguration, the End of the uh, Free Trade e Era. Um, I think we'll start by saying that uh, along with uh, the political earthquake, uh, which we are discussing uh, further uh, earlier today, uh, that took place in 2016, uh, the discussion about uh, the future of uh, economic policy uh, followed. Uh, and the hardest hit in this debate uh, was uh, taken by uh, globalization uh, and uh, free trade uh, agreement, uh, since it is believed that uh, they are the ones uh, who, which accelerate the uh, globalization processes. Uh, so to start our uh, discussion, uh, I would first uh, ask uh, Mr. Uh, James uh, Sproul, uh, Chief Economist and uh, Director of uh, Policy for Institute for uh, Directors, for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to stand up and uh, very quickly say, uh, by the way, Institute of Directors I just left last week, so I'm, I'm going to be doing a, a number of different things over the rest of the summer. I've put some slides up here, and I realize they're very difficult to see, um, but if you go to the Free Market Roadshow website, the entire slide deck is there and you can just download it very easily. So, uh, and I'm not going to look at all of the slides either because I don't have very much time. Just let's quick look, quickly look at Brexit to begin with because Brexit really is a very, very important thing and it's a lot about globalization as well. And when people look at Brexit, I think it's very important to remember what a Swiss psychiatrist said in 1969. This is a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and she said there's five stages of grief five stages away that people get used to a new idea. And whether that new idea is Brexit or whether that new idea is globalization, it really doesn't matter, but it's, it's, there's five stages here. The first stage, and you, you probably can't read it very well, but that's denial. A lot of times when people see a new thing, they deny it's happening. They say things like, Britain will not leave the European Union. I have news for you. Britain is going to leave the European Union. It may be good, it may be bad, we can argue about it, but it is going to happen. After the denial, people say, they start to get angry. And if you've been looking at social media in the United Kingdom over the last few months, you've seen a lot of anger. A lot of people cannot believe that the UK is going to be doing this. Well, we are. And as I say, it could be good, it could be bad, we can, we can debate that, but it is going to happen. It doesn't matter whether you're angry. You then move into bargaining. And we've seen the beginnings of bargaining. So the EU says it's going to cost Britain 60 billion euros to leave. No, I mean 100 billion euros. And the UK says it's going to cost them nothing. This is bargaining. It's bargaining with big figures, but it's bargaining. When bargaining doesn't work, and if you're 100 billion euros apart, it's not going to work, you get depression. I can't believe it's going to be as bad as it is. And you get very depressed about it. And that's to come. And eventually, you get to acceptance. And how long does it take to get to acceptance? How long is a piece of string? Is it months? Is it years? I don't know. But one thing that Kubler-Ross does say is the first person to get to acceptance is usually the one who's the most affected by it all. So in other words, the British are probably going to get to acceptance sometime before Mr. Juncker does. And the other thing to remember is that the person who starts out denying it eventually does get to acceptance. So it's the same person. So people's views change over time. And I think that views change over globalization, over Brexit, over a lot of things, but people do take time to get used to ideas. So globalization. Now, I am an enormous proponent of globalization. I think globalization has been a great thing. But at the same time, I have to admit that globalization faces some really significant challenges right now. And what are they? Well, the first one is let's look at the things that are, are helping globalization. More countries are attaining middle class income status and rising productivity. Well, that's, that's absolutely true. You look at the, the developments that Poland has, all, has gone, undergone in the last generation. Your parents' generation had a very, very different look in the world. And what's happened now has been very beneficial for all of you. And that's great, and I hope it continues. The internet makes things much, much easier. You can buy and shop and, and use social media in a way that your previous generations couldn't imagine. Again, you're much more connected. If you want to connect to me on Twitter or on Facebook or on, on LinkedIn, it's easy. You can do that. You can go back to your, your rooms tonight, hit, hit that thing, oh, that guy spoke in interestingly. It's very easy to do. And trade in natural resources has certainly made people much, much more interdependent than they've ever been before. At the same time, there's some things that are starting to move the other way. Most trade today is not in goods. Trading goods is easy to measure. Things, 
you know, whether it's, it's bottles of water, it's, it's notebooks, it's computers, but most things today are actually services, and services are more difficult to trade, and therefore it's easier to stop them. The European Union talks a lot about free trade, but in fact it never completed the trade in, the, uh, in services for the single market, because it's hard, because it's complicated, because the French, I wish the French were as good at entrepreneurialism as they are at regulation, because they are world class at inventing regulation. That's why we don't have as much of that as we would like. China. We've heard an enormous amount about China and how it's grown in the last 20 years. And that's absolutely right. It has. It's grown phenomenally well. Will it continue to grow as well in the next 20 years? My contention is no, it won't. Part of that reason is because the easy growth has been undertaken. Part of that reason is because much of the growth that China has right now is a lot about construction. And it's very easy to push a button and say, construction. It's much more difficult to push a button and say, and make that construction useful. We have robots taking a lot of our jobs, and people uh, are very, very scared of not just um, people in, in Eastern Europe taking their jobs in the United Kingdom, but people from robots. And in fact, that's probably a bigger threat to most low-skilled workers than any other. Uh, and finally, um, we may not be as peaceful for the next 20 years as we've been in the last 20 years. Now, we've not obviously had a big war in Europe, or a bit of a war in the Balkans, but no big war. Is that going to continue? I certainly hope so, but it's always wise to be cautious. So let's look at some of the other um, challenges. This is um, a graph which, again, you probably can't see all that well. It's called the elephant graph, and it was not unfortunately drawn by myself. Um, but you can see here at the bottom is uh, income percentiles of people. This is around the world, and the number of people in it. And you can see here's here's people. So people in the top, oh gosh, easily half have have grown much much richer. The people, the poorest people in the world, once down here, they're still very very poor. They were very poor. They're, they continue to be very poor. Um, that's not good. It's just it's just there. But if you were in the top, say, halfway up the thing, you've seen 70% growth in your income. This is fantastic. But somebody is also losing in all of this. And the people who've lost are the low-skilled people in developed economies. They are here. And they're not happy about it. And they voted for Donald Trump. And they voted for Brexit. And they left their elites in no um, uncertain terms that they were not happy about the way of things were going in the world. So how are we going to make certainly in, in the UK, how are we going to make these people happy to make sure that we can all prosper in the future? That's really the challenge for us right now. Now, I've got lots and lots of charts here, which A, you can't see, and B, I don't have time to go through. So I'm just going to go through to different parts of development from here on in. Now, I have five. Four not very optimistic ones and one very optimistic one. <coughs> so what are the four? I have what I call patchy development. This is a, certainly a, a very viable scenario. If we look at patchy development, what's a country that's had patchy development? Well, India is a, a really good example of patchy development. The India has great IT services. If the Indian bureaucracy had gotten hold of IT services, you can guarantee that it would have been strangled at birth. There's a thing in India called the permit raj, which is the bureau bureaucrats killing everything they get their hands onto. The, the great thing for India was IT grew so big, so fast, that the, the the bureaucrats never saw it coming. So it grew too big to the point where it was important enough, they couldn't kill it anymore. But we can have the same thing here in Europe. You can have what I call Pimpernel development. Now, Pimpernel probably doesn't mean anything to you, but in English language, Pimpernel was a spy in the First World War. And the old phrase was, you see him here, you see him there, you don't see him anywhere. Well, that's Japan. Japan is a very rich country, and it grew very, very fast for a very long time. For 20 years, it's always been just about to grow. You sort of see growth in the future but it never comes. So we can have that. We can have long-term stagnation. We don't. There's no God-given right for Europe to grow. Nobody's seen it. God didn't say, Europe, you will always grow. Africa, you always be poor. Maybe it's going to be the reverse. And if we don't work hard, we make that more likely. We have what I call phantom development. This is China. A lot of it is about uh, construction, as I was saying a moment ago. Uh, you can push a lot of, of development, and you kid yourself that you're long-term and sustainable. <coughs> Um, and I don't think it's going to happen. And then finally, we have what I call Piranesi development. Piranesi, for those of you who don't know, is, is a, an Italian artist, um, drew absolutely gorgeous paintings of ruins in, in Rome and ruins. It's very, very pretty, but it's not growth. It's just sort of a pleasant place to live with no growth. And that, unfortunately, is what Italy is headed for and what much of Europe and particularly Mediterranean Europe is headed for. So let's be optimistic. There's a thing out there which I'm calling the intellectual revolution. The intellectual revolution is the way in which, and IT is, is, the, is the, the 
the circulatory system. It's what makes it possible, but it's all about knowledge and information and the way that people use knowledge and information, which is changing remarkably. It's very difficult to say which way it's going to be changing in future, but you can already start to see the way in which people use it to market to all of us, the way in which people use it to access goods and services, and the way in which we're going to lead our lives in the future. And the more that we in Europe can grasp hold of this, the better our future is going to be. I'm just going to close on, on this. This is, again, difficult to see. Um, if you can sort of see here, there's a, a patch here at the front. That was entrepreneurialism in 2001. If we look at something like the United Kingdom, about 6% of people worked in a firm of less than three years old. Today, that number is about 12%. So it's doubled. That's pretty good. The US started at 12%, it's about 18% today. But the other thing you see here is the incredible explosion in these people up here. These countries up here. Huge number of people around the world starting their own companies, getting into the economy, becoming part of that global economy. This is absolutely fantastic. The world's most entrepreneurial com country, by the way, is Zambia. Um, not many people will guess that. Uh, and I would say that the reason, of course, if you're not an entrepreneur in Zambia, you don't have a job. But um, that's called forced entrepreneurship. But in fact, there's been an enormous explosion there. What the problem is, and if you can see these darker lines, those darker lines are the European Union. The European Union tends to be the least entrepreneurial part of the world. And that's a big challenge for us. And the bits of Europe that are, that are entrepreneurial tend to be in Eastern Europe, so the Baltic States, Poland, Czech Republic. So you guys are doing all right, but the EU as a whole faces an enormous problem. The least entrepreneurial parts of, of Europe sit down in the Mediterranean. How are we going to get them to start working again? How are we going to get them to start being dynamic? And that is an enormous challenge for us in the next few years. And I think, much more than Brexit, when we look back in 20, 30 years' time, I don't think you'll be able to see where Brexit occurred on, on a chart. I just don't think it's going to matter enough. What's going to matter for our longer-term prosperity is can we grasp the opportunities that are out there in terms of this intellectual revolution? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, and now turn to uh, Marcin Halowski, uh, Vice President at Freedom and Entrepreneurship Foundation. Uh, if you can be a little bit briefer than uh, Mr. Stroh, uh, I would be grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the fact is that I am a, a political philosopher. I'm a doctor of political philosophy. And uh, what it means is not only the fact that my approach will be a little bit different than the approach of economists, but also it means that I am not a Doctor Strange. So I do not have any special magical powers and I don't have any kind of magical artifacts like, let's say, crystal ball. That's why I don't know, I, I really don't know how the future will look like. But uh, I can give you at least two scenarios. Uh, both of them will be quite idealistic. One of them will be positive, one of them will be negative, of course. So let's start from the positive one. In a positive scenario, the future will look like that. Uh, there will be total free trade. Uh, we will be able to trade with goods, ideas. Uh, we will be able to communicate each other, and everything should be quite good. This is a, let's say, positive utopia, right? So this is a positive scenario. Second one is, uh, humanity will fall into the bunch of, uh, even not a nations, but a tribes, who will be fighting for scarce resources. And this is, at least for me, dystopian scenario. The main problem is that for many people, my dystopia is their utopia. And my utopia is their dystopia. We, let's say that we, so the, the, the intellectuals, people who are trained to use our minds in a quite rational way, at least when it's possible, because remember about the uh, kind of biological regulations that we unfortunately have, uh, well, for us, the utopian way of living would be uh, absolutely free trade. Why? Because it will give us a more and better life for all of us. But for the people who prefer to, um, let's say, be less uh, modern thinking on that, the best idea would be to live in a tribe because of many ideas that they believe that are the best one. So, when we have our, the title of our panel is A Major Economic Reconfiguration, I would say that the better title would be, uh, sorry for the organizers, but the better title would be a major idea reconfiguration. Because now, 
uh, everything that you can see, well, even in the, in the shops, the things that you can buy that are waiting for you on, uh, on the shelves, uh, you have them because of the fact that some people believe in some kind of ideas. Not only because of that, but this is the first mover for the whole chain of production. This is the first mover, kind of idea. And uh, our main problem today is that our idea is starts to losing, fortunately. We are losing. More rational approach is less attractive, more pro-nationalistic, in a bad sense, uh, pro-tribe, and closed. Approach is, le is more and more uh, well important and, and, and good for the people. They believe that this is good. Why it's happening like that? Uh, there is an article, a paper, wrote by uh, Paul Rubin. He's an economist, and the title is uh, Folks Economics. Folks Economics. Um, what about is it? Uh, he writes that uh, every people have his own, well, um, sense of economics, and folks economics is a way of thinking about economics that untrained people have. This is, well, a bunch of superstitions, um, a kind of uh, intuitions about economics, but this is not an actual science. The problem for most of the time, well, sorry, for most of the time the elites believes that folks economics is, well, it, this is a fault, this is just a common sense, but this is not a science, this is not a science, it's just a common sense. Uh, they tried to apply different scientific approaches. Some of them were good, like Milton Friedman approach. Some of them were bad, like John Maynard Keynes. But at least he tried to use his brain, at least. Well, unfortunately, he failed. Uh, the today problem is that um, our rational approach need to fight on the, on the arena of battle of ideas with uh, something very tribal and very difficult to very difficult to catch even, and uh, I hope that, uh, that we won't lose. What we need to do, in my opinion, is to show a positive narrations, even if they will be quite simplified, but not very simplistic. Uh, we need to show to the people that uh, having a global market is something bad, sorry, something absolutely good. Uh, and we, use not on we need to use not only philosophers, not only uh, economists and political scientists, because this is a political problem too, Brexit, for, for, for instance, uh, but we need to use artists, uh, screenwriters, and other people who are able to communicate in an effective way. If we won't do it, uh, well, someone's utopia will become our dystopia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and now uh, we turn to... Uh, Professor Bogna Gavrinskanovak, Dean of Economics and Management Faculty here at Wazarski University, uh, who has also a presentation about uh, perception of free trade. Um, hello, everybody. Actually, I'm, I'm not the, the dean at the moment. I try to be rather academic, uh, and this is my opinion and the result of the research that we've done together with my colleagues. Uh, I try to be brief, however, academic, but okay. Um, well, I've done some job recently. I would like to uh, share my experience with you concerning this job. So I was asked by the uh, representation of the Polish Commission to consult the process of the CETA implementation. Therefore, I had to meet different social groups and talk to them. And I was supposed to explain the uh, expected outcomes, effects of uh, CETA implementation in Poland. Certainly, I, I treat my job very seriously. I prepare all these, you know, CGE models, computation general equilibrium models, look at the uh, econometric estimations concerning job growth, economic growth, all this for, you know, a couple of decades and so on. I came to Brussels. I met some Polish parliamentary groups. I met Polish people here as well, representat representatives of different social groups. And I found out that I'm completely useless, because they already knew everything, <laughs> right? I, I, to be honest, I didn't even manage okay, to talk about what comes out from not my research only, but also from research uh, that is, uh, I would say, widely propagated, because I don't know whether you know, but the costs and the benefits of CETA implementation as well as TTIP 
uh, they have been actually uh, very carefully studied, analyzed, and we've got lots of interesting reports. So that was like kind of, you know, wow, bang for me, yeah? Uh, I started thinking that maybe social perception or expectations met a bit more, right, than what are the effects. And therefore, that's why how I started, in effect, doing some research. Well, first, I discovered, to be honest, that um, social perception is not that negative about free trade agreements. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, but a, a Eurobarometer started asking in this big survey, you know, concerning what Europeans think about various issues, started uh, Im implemented the first question concerning what do you think about TTIP, are you against, are you for, uh, it was in uh, autumn uh, 2014, so not that long time ago. And I found out, that, uh, as you may see, or you can't see actually, because probably the visibility is very poor, that more than 50% of Europeans actually are for TTIP, this well-defined uh, uh, agreement. So not that negative. If you look at, at some groups, right, like country-specific opinions, uh, there are actually three nations that are very strongly against, I would say. Germans, Austrians, and people from Luxembourg. If you look for those that are very positive about it, they're supporting this, then you have to look at, I would say, uh, transformation economies. Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, Poland as well. If you look at the tendency in time, you will see that kind of support, unfortunately, decreases. Um, then my next question, in fact, was, okay, uh, what is the base to formulate opinion, whether I am against or for TTIP or CETA or, okay, those two, in fact, they've been recently implemented, or TTIP not implemented yet, and actually we don't know whether it would be implemented anyway in the future, but I started asking myself questions, okay, what drives these people, you know? Well, and therefore, immediately the next question came out, well, how far or how close the kind of opinions are, in fact, to the expert opinion. So therefore, in fact, uh, to understand that a bit better, uh, I decided to ask my colleagues, that are much better at, I would say, analyzing perception, to go for a research in that area, and we started doing some research I don't know whether you're familiar, but uh, that was on the base of a content analysis. That means that we got an access to articles and comments in the, the internet. All of them uh, actually sorted, like filtered, uh, containing a CETA word. And we tried to have a look at the opinions they express in the internet, trying to analyze uh, that. What we found out, actually. Okay, first of all, the large part of analyzed comments uh, were not completely uh, connected with the CETA in itself. They were, in fact, um, attached to some articles that about CETA, but they were like, okay, completely missing the point. Then a lot of number of comments, uh, a low number of comments used uh, professional terminology. A uh, high level of co-occurrence of CETA and TTIP that we observed may mean that, in fact, people treat those two agreements as equal. Moreover, things like GMO, food, and corporations, I would say that kind of uh, subject are us, they were extremely popular, and therefore we believe, we think, which is maybe not a kind of big discovery, that this is something that causes main threats among public uh, opinion. Then articles, if you compare articles and, uh, and the comments, right, in the internet, they were a bit more probably merit-oriented. However, I must tell you that when we filtered a part of those contents uh, in order to have a look at them in a bit more focused way, and we tried to concentrate on the I I ICDS uh, question, then we observed that in fact comments sometimes contain a bit more merit-oriented merit message 
than articles in itself. Of, of, certainly, I'm talking about the, all the articles and comments that were uh, in Polish. Then we decided to uh, go for um, a kind of expert judgment. We run an expert panel consisting of four uh, experts. They were asked by us to judge the content uh, um, of the articles and the comments uh, using a kind of classification, zero, one, two, uh, three. All of this just to say whether this is close to truth or quite distant from truth. And I must say that according to that panel, well, uh, again, they found out that the articles are more merit-oriented than the comments. However, uh, well, they were different in terms of, of the professional, uh, professional uh, occupation because we had like uh, two business analysts, one economist and one lawyer. Uh, so probably they were a little bit tempted to, you know, judge what they were good at. Therefore, the opinions were uh, diversified. Uh, uh, there are some other features maybe that influence their opinions about it. But uh, again, uh, they found quite a number, in fact, 56% uh, of the whole content missing the point. So, um, summing it up briefly, well, um, what we found out so far, there was just a pilot survey that we conducted and we're going to continue under Santander bank, under funds given by the bank, Santander Bank. So, uh, what we have found out at that stage, it seems like majority of the comments and articles that are supposed to be devoted to a CETA uh, issue are completely missing the point. They are not oriented on merits. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, Mr. Alexander Waszek, is Chief Economist in Civil Development uh, Forum. Uh, please uh, say your opening statement. Welcome, everybody. Much have been already said, um, but for me, the most puzzling thing is that both economic theory and uh, empirical evidence indicates that free trade make us welfare. So why there is such opposition to it? In my opinion, it's not as irrational as it might seem. Uh, because currently, benefits of free trade are much more nuanced than they used to be. Uh, why? Because uh, currently, it's not only final consumer goods that are being traded, but the trade in services and intermediate goods is the key issue in international trade. And uh, it's much harder for politicians or vested interest groups to protest against, for example, cheaper clothes, cheaper cars, because uh, people want to have uh, cheaper cars in shops or cheaper clothes. They will oppose measures that uh, are banning import of cheap cars. But when we are talking about, for example, accounting services, whether a company that is selling a car to me can outsource accounting services or legal services or more much intangible things, then people uh, do not gasp uh, how it affects them, but it affects costs of companies that are servicing them. Higher costs of the companies, higher prices for consumers. And now the issue is mainly about this intermediate goods. And nobody likes competition. So accountant firms, legal companies, and all the services are fighting against free trade. Uh, we heard a lot about regulation in Euro Euro United Europe, in the European Union. But uh, in case of Poland, we hear that uh, France want to ban Polish truck drivers from working in uh, France and so on. But, but despite all these uh, problems, I would like to point that free trade uh, in services, maybe, sorry, not free trade, trade in services in Europe is more advanced than in other parts of the world. When you look at the trade openness, that is export plus import, of European Union countries and other OECD members, you see that trade in goods uh, amounts to about 80, uh, about 64% of GDP in Europe on average, 
and 83, uh, sorry, 64 uh, percent in Europe, and 83, uh, sorry, once again, 64 in non-European uh, OECD members, and 83 percent in European uh, Union member states. So, in terms of trade in goods, Europe is about one third more open than uh, other OEC member states. But when we look at the services, trade in services in uh, non-EU OECD members is only 25% of the day GDP. In Europe, it's on average 50% of GDP. So despite all these problems and regulations, slowly but and slowly, but we are pushing ahead with uh, freer trade in um, services with a, a lot of uh, opposition because consumers do not benefit directly and these indirect effects are much harder um, to advocate. And I think that's the main issue to show this in, uh, indirect effects and how they affect prices at the shell of the shop. Thank you so much. And now I'll turn to the questions. Um, I want to ask uh, you, James, you said um, at, the, at the beginning that you are a strong uh, believer in globalization. Uh, however, now um, uh, the, the way uh, to achieve the, the goal uh, was uh, doing by uh, free trade agreements. Um, and now the free trade agreements are under search. Uh, we heard what the president of the United States of America said about it and, and started doing it. Doing it. Uh, so in your opinion, what's the uh, best uh, alternative to achieve uh, your, our uh, aims uh, without free trade agreements? Um, it's often said that, that we need these free trade agreements and there's been a lot of discussion in the United Kingdom surrounding Brexit as to whether we'll get a free trade agreement with the rest of the European Union. I certainly hope we will, but I'm not absolutely certain that we will. Um, if we look at what globalization has done in the last 20, 30 years, uh, much of it is trade with the United States, trade with Asia, um, and we don't have free tra trade agreements with them. Uh, so it's quite obvious uh, that an enormous amount of trade goes on without an agreement, and we shouldn't lose track of that. So it's desirable to have a free trade agreement, but it's not necessary to have one. And so, um, I, you know, I've seen various parts of, of an iPhone, you know, how much of an iPhone is, is built in China, how much of the intellectual property is, is designed in California, um, you know, and, and the marketing advertising might be taking place here in Europe because that's where the, the phone is sold. That's a globalized product. And more and more of what we want are those types of products. So. I, I would love to see more free trade agreements, but I don't think it's necessary to see them in order to get globalization. Thank you. Uh, and uh, now to Vice President Chmielewski. Um There was a lot of discussion uh, about uh, free trade policy uh, in, in Europe uh, on the uh, be begin beginning of the 20th century, the end of the 19th century. Uh, Frederick List, uh, the famous uh, German economist uh, and the intellectual uh, father of the uh, European economic area, uh, said that free trade policy are only beneficiary for strong and well-developed economies, so for poorer countries protection is, is, is recommended. And the, the following, the, the similar line was taken by Karl Polanyi, a Hungarian economist. Uh, so um, I want to ask you, are they wrong? If, if so, why? Yes, they are. Of course they are. And why? Uh, well, we can see it. Well, uh, yes, Poland economically is uh, Germany, but still we are stronger than we was before we started to uh, well mutually benefit from free trade with them. So yes, they are winning, but we are winning too. Economics is win-win situation, and well, free trade is a win-win situation. Of course, it depends who wins more and who wins less. But uh, I think that uh, both sides are winning. So yes, uh, this, uh, th th this claim that uh, someone need to win, uh, mm, sorry, someone need to lose, uh, mm, for someone need to win, is just a, well, 
Well, reality shows that it, it doesn't work like that. And uh, back in 19th century, almost all countries uh, had very strong um, barriers and tariffs on the borders. Maybe one of the examples were Liechtenstein, but they were together in one sphere with Austro-Hungary. But this is an this is an example. Well, this is this is something small. Uh, for most of the time, uh, all the countries had their own spheres of uh, high taxes on their borders, and still some of them were um, getting and getting getting more and more um, wealthy, and some of them not. So maybe it's not because of that, right? It's maybe not of the tariffs and taxes. Maybe it's because of the rule of law, like we had in UK. Maybe it's because of, well, less regulatory systems. Maybe it's because of, well, strong civic society, which is also important, because someone needs to, well, watch the hands of, of the politi politics. So that's why I believe that he was wrong. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, now I want to uh, ask uh, Professor uh, Gawrinska, um you said about uh, how hard it is for uh, so-called ordinary people to understand uh, international free trade deals. Uh, so I want to um, ask you because um, during the debate, uh, especially about the TIP in, during the, in the European Parliament, uh, there was some representative uh, representing uh, more li liberal uh, side of of the of the issue by uh, they are pointing out that why uh, we have these thousands of pages of uh, supposedly meaning this driva when we are talking uh, supposedly about free trade agreement uh, and they pointed out that at NAFTA that they have only three three hundred pages and TTIP has so many so. Is it necessary for free trade, free trade agreement nowadays to, to be so, so, so lengthy and so complicated? Or is it really something in this argument? Yeah, my perception, although I was talking about perception, my perception is poor, so I can't see another microphone, but I will use this one. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if, if it is worth to be complicated in this contemporary world anymore. So I don't know whether it is worth to have complicated documents. But um, uh, okay, CETA and TTIP they are completely different agreements, and uh, um, they um, they've got many aspects. This is not just a free trade agreement, in fact, right? Because uh, they are talking also about investment. They uh, they are pointing out lots of things, so uh, they must be complex, ex definition, I would say. And uh, actually, uh, when you look at the um, documents that are produced, yes, massive loads of documents being produced in that, but that's a natural consequence because <laughs> every aspect of that type of agreement must be covered. They are supposed to be very unique, and they are very unique in their nature. I think you will not find anything like that in a history in the past, like CETA or TTI. IP, yeah. So uh, I do realize, I do understand that, that there, we've got a communication issue here because how to translate that complicated word of so many aspects, paragraphs, and so on to a public discourse, and that's uh, very important because now I realize that in fact what a so-called public opinion uh, thinks about it uh, is very quickly uh, being transformed into self-fulfilling prophecy. So I realized that the one thing is that well, we can have a look at an objective way, like from the expert point of view, and we can have a look at the positive, for example, average growth rate, estimated, right, a job growth uh, rate, and so on and so on. But another story is how, in fact, uh, the experts, how, how they communicate with the public. And I must tell you that I can see, it seems to me, that this is going to be a major issue as well, for, the, for example, for the European Commission, how to communicate with the public and how to convince, in fact, people, not convince them either, you know, be uh, against or uh, for, of course, for, <laughs> but uh, just to... Uh, just to convince them to have a look at that in an objective way. And I must tell you that um, the, uh, the way that the internet provided discussion is being held, it is so simple, right? And it focuses on so well-defined issues that, of course, are labels immediately ex ante, right? 
So it is very hard to communicate. And I believe that or I don't know. I, I don't have a kind of ready-made recipe how to you know communicate. But I'm completely positive and sure that uh, the positive message must be given because, well, for example, when I was talking to people about um, investment to state deputy settlement, that very controversial issue, yeah. So lots of people believe think that this is a kind of biggest threat. For example, under CETA agreement. But in fact, in a CETA, this is a unique solution that it's got a, a kind of unique features that are so objective. I mean, everything that you can um, uh, complain about, uh, if you look at the, that kind of procedure in, for example, TTIP, that has been sorted out. It's been solved in, in CETA. Nobody knows about it. It seems like that. So I, I believe now, although it sounds even for me, being macroeconomist, that I'm talking about absurd here, really, but it seems like convincing people is probably the most crucial question here. Okay, thank you. Um, now, um, also um, following the uh, ideas of the new president of the United States, uh, the new administration, the U.S., and also uh, British government uh, after the uh, after the Brexit vote uh, said that they're going to be uh, negotiating uh, free free trade agreements. But uh, Trump administration said that instead of uh, going into multi multilateral agreements, they are turning into uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, so. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Russia, can you tell me, uh, do you see any differences between uh, multilateral uh, agreements and bilateral agreements? Or are they going to be beneficiary for the U.S. Uh, or Britain, in that matter, or, or, or not? Of course, uh, more free trade will be beneficial, but when we are switching from multi mm, uh, to, to bilateral mm, trade agreements, it means that trade with different uh, states will be subject to different regulations. So again, it will be much more complicated. And uh, you said that, um, quoted that free trade is beneficial for stronger. Uh, of course, that's not true. And when it comes to free trade agreements, it's more beneficial for smaller but not for smaller countries but for smaller enterprises when you are apple company you don't need free trade agreement to have your lawyers in china and go through the regulation but you when you are small enterprise it's much better to be in european union and have european regulation with all its drawbacks but it's still easier for you to make business in other European countries than have uh, lawyers in each uh, other country and try to get through their regulation. So this multi, mm, bil uh, not bilateral, uh, multilateral mm, trade agreements offer simpler regulation and simpler access for smaller companies and thus greater scope for growth, greater scope for, for specialization and these are the main sources of uh, economic growth, specialization. Uh, thank you. Now I want to ask the audience for, for questions. Is there a chance for someone to speak up? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Mr. Spro, I have a question regarding the elephant graph you have shown. Um, more specifically, I'm curious about as to what policies you suggest uh, in order to alleviate the dip that the working class of the rich countries has to suffer. What do you suggest? If I, if I had a, a nice, quick, easy um, uh, solution to this, I would be on my way back up to this part of the world to pick up my Nobel Prize in Stockholm. So uh, I'm afraid I don't have a nice, quick... Yet. But they're certainly ignoring that problem, ignoring the concerns of those people, does lead to a degree of frustration, and we've seen that. And I don't think it's confined to the, the United States or to, to the United Kingdom. I think it's felt across you know, in Germany, it's felt in France, it's felt, you know, it's, it's a very common across all developed economies. And the, the politicians who come up with the solutions to that are going to be very good and uh, are, are very popular. The, the, the key, if you don't want populism, if you don't want a Marine Le Pen, is to find effective solutions to that. Because if you don't find them, 
that is probably one of the things that could become more prevalent in your economy. So um, I don't have an immediate solution. I, I wish I did. Thank you. Anything else from the audience? No? Okay. Uh, so, oh, okay. Uh, I have a question to, to Professor Gavronska because you, you mentioned this perception of free trade agreements and the story how it started from uh, your meetings with the European uh, Commission. Uh, do you have any experience about them being, being interested in this type of approach of looking how to uh, encourage European citizens to do some kind of ideas? Yeah, Digitrade Department, I greet them and, uh, well, uh, I do appreciate what they do, yeah. <laughs> they are very professional what they do. But uh, they're very technical, you know, and they very focus on, I would say, what's, uh, what is in, in the agreement, what is the content. They were so active in the negotiations, this professional, they come up with, you know, a high standard, but they, I think they... They realize more and more. Now I'm talking generally about uh, my very probably subjective perception again of what's uh, going on in, in the um, European Commission that they are aware of the, the, the problem. I mean, they have to communicate, but they don't have an, uh, I would say, well specified policy. Um, I don't know whether any of you have ever tried, for example, to consult anything. Uh, under European Commission. You know, this is uh, available on the website. You have a special survey. It consists of 100 plus questions, all right, in which you can express your opinion. Uh, it was very hard for me. I've got my PhD in, in economics and then I got my Polish version of, you know, degree, uh, Habilitatia in International Finance. It was awfully hard for me, to be honest. I don't know, maybe this, this is, that says something wrong about me, could be, yeah. But, um, Okay, this is not the type of, a, of a, I would say, public or social consulting process that I would very personally see as, as something that call, that you know causes kind of positive feedback that 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 causes the, the real type of you know communication. Yeah, and fortunately, whether we like it or dislike it, communicating is all about very simple messages. I hate it. I mean, because how can I? communicate about, as I'm saying, CG models, yeah, and what they say about, but some, some, unfortunately, I think I, I, I have to find my way to do it, yeah. So, uh, I can't be very optimistic, I'm afraid about it. I, they, I think that they recognize the need, the necessity, yeah, but, um, I, I don't know how about a, a very well-defined PR policy. Okay, thank you. There was a question there. Thank you very much. Thank you to, to all the panelists. It was a spectacular panel. My question is to James and whoever other who, who wants to add a, a, something. I, I, free trades are free trade agreements certainly are questionable. It's managed trade to a certain extent. I mean, free trade agreements should be very short. You know, should be able to, you know, fit in a napkin. Just you know, we abolish all tariffs, and they are not like that. But on the other hand, it's true that trade has grown spectacularly thanks to, to free trade. If free trade agreements are, are a managed trade, you know, the, a multiplication of bilateral agreements, wouldn't it be micromanaged trade and wouldn't, wouldn't we be in an in a even worse position regarding, regarding trade? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the problems right now we have, certainly looking at the EU, is that it's so difficult to achieve trade, to achieve consensus amongst the EU, that the um, good becomes the enemy of perfect. And so, um, because we can't get perfect, we don't get good. And that's that's a real problem. I think it's, in, in some ways, that what we should be looking for is establishing, say, standards in data protection. Which, for which nobody really has an answer. So it's easier because there's no entrenched positions. And if we could get that, say if, if the European Union and the United States could get a, an agreed uh, standard on data protection, that would be enormously beneficial to what I call the intellectual revolution, but to companies that use data and, and how they do that. And because there's no established uh, groundwork there, what you establish will quickly become the global standard, and that would be very good for both European companies, American companies, but also Asian companies. Um, rather than trying to bang away about agricultural products, which 
it's, it's almost impossible to get agreement on, or get the French to agree that their people actually like to watch American films, um, and the French government seems to think that they shouldn't be allowed to. Um, that, that's, that's very hard, and you just create a, an enormous amount of, of blockage when you, you try to go for that sort of thing. Can add something to that, right? Um, that's, uh, that, that sounds a little bit like a uh, ideological question now, you know, because it's, it's whether you believe or not in returns to scale, right? And commonly recognized standards. Uh, well, uh, if you if you even read, I don't know, the latest works by Krugman uh, and what what he thinks and what he says about the uh, the regionalization in the very negative sense, right? The, the bilateral agreements that um, substituting uh, multilateral ones, yeah. So uh, this is, after all, I think very discriminatory, and it's got a, a kind of negative effect, finally. So, uh, mm, well, I think that whether we like it again or dislike it, globalization is happening. And therefore, now turning into the phase of like redefining slightly the way you agree about the trade and so on, and like neglecting this possibility to have a kind of, you know, really wide, broad approach, I think it sounds a little bit uh, against this tendency, no matter what the politicians think and say. But this is, you know, like my opinion. Thank you. Gentleman there. Uh, Rafał Szczykowski, Civil Development Forum. Um, I have one more question on the elephant graph, because I'm not entirely convinced uh, that, it's, uh, that it uh, explains the rise of populism. Um, uh, so another <laughs> question to Mrs. Sproul. Um, when I think about the rise of populism, uh, three countries pop up in my head. It's Poland, it's Turkey, it's Hungary. So and these are three countries that actually benefited from the trade reallocation uh, that, that caused the, the, the elephant graph uh, in the developed world. Um, so I, I do you think that uh, these are just totally different causes or Yes, th those are those are actually good countries to because they are the counterfactual examples. Absolutely, and to be honest, I hadn't thought of those countries in, in looking at this. I think that that elephant graph is—I uh, would never say it's the whole explanation, but it's certainly an explanation for, particularly in the United States and in the United Kingdom, um, Poland, Hungary, and Turkey have not achieved the same degree of wealth that the United States and the United Kingdom have reached, and therefore there's not the same frustration amongst those people. So I think they're clearly different drivers in those cases. Um, and, you know, the, the Turks, I think it's uh, more to do with Istanbul versus the countryside. Um, and Hungarians and Poles, I'm not as familiar with what the, the driving forces are. So uh, I think you put your finger on, there can be a variety of drivers, but I think this for highly developed economies, this is probably one of the, the basic uh, explanations. Okay, thank you. And uh, Last question, I believe, if it is anything else, yes, please. My name is Tomasz Pratsky. I would like to ask you about the Brexit, because Brexit means um, leaving the United Kingdom. Yes, leaving Europe by the United Kingdom, so by England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. What happens if Scotland and Northern Ireland leave the United Kingdom? and want to come back to the European Union. Could you please comment on this? Because I think it's quite a plausible, possible scenario. Yes, um, there's certainly been an enormous amount of debate about this in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, as you realize, there's a general election um, campaign going on at the moment. And the Scottish National Party, which did extremely well in the last general election, they, there's 50, 55, 56 parliamentary seats in Scotland, they won all but three. Um, the general consensus now is they, they will not do as well, and that the high water mark and push towards um, uh, independence by the Scots is probably on a downward slope now. Obviously, it could increase in the future, but for the moment it seems that the, the threat of that has passed. But taking your question, and what happens if um, Scotland, and I, I don't think Northern Ireland would break away without Scotland, but if Scotland and Northern Ireland were to break away, I mean, they might. That, that's absolutely true. They might in the future decide that England and Wales were not as prosperous as, as the future. Um, personally, I would caution the Scots. I think that small countries within the European Union often get bossed about, and the idea that you get to 
say your voice and your voice gets paid attention to, well, talk to the Irish. Talk to the Irish about what happens when you, you say to them, I want to default on my bonds, um, and the Germans tell you that they would prefer you to have um, debt that lasted 60 to 70 years instead. And your voice doesn't matter. So it's, um, it's, it's a difficult thing. I, I, I think the Scots face a difficult decision. I think actually the UK has been very, very beneficial to the Scots. They don't always appreciate it as much as I believe they should. Thank you. Anything else? No. Okay. So I have this maybe last question for, for uh, Mr. Chmielowski. How should we address uh, the issue uh, of uh, free trade and the, the ben benefits uh, coming from there to, to earn a uh, wider audience, to, to, to reach to the people who are now against it or reluctant about it? Well, the only answer that I, I have for you, at least for now, is to, to do it in a diverse way. To have more than just one uh, channel of doing that, and to do it uh, well by different people, uh, by different, um, well, maybe uh, local authorities, so, so call them, that, them like that, well, natural elites. Uh, believe me that for many people, what I have to say, well, they just don't care. Why? Because I am young and I am a philosopher, this is not a normal job. Okay, fine. But many people really believe what uh, the priests are talking to them. We need more pro-market priests, at least in Poland, right? Because they are, well, natural-born leaders in their communities. And uh, we need more uh, pro-market journalists, because some people will believe in them. Uh, okay, he's a journalist, so he's he's smart and he's always against government. Poles really believes on that. Uh, it not always it not always works like that. And we need well professor, we need scientists, we need screenwriters, we need celebrities. So different kind of people, different kind of approaches. And I think that this is the only way that we can win, because people are just different, and we need to make diverse actions. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's concluded the, uh, the panel. Thank you for attending our forum and give a, a voice for